do, 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 do. Greetings. Ever heard of a potential energy before? Man, it's hot today. I've been outside for like six hours walking, taking pictures. Um, potential energy. Let's first uh, give a, uh, a note to establish, and we don't need the math. The math is not up for dispute on calculating potential energy of a falling object, or actually, of course, it's always two objects that are mutually accelerating towards one another. It's just that if one mass is extremely large, then the uh, mutual acceleration is imperceptible from the really large mass, but potential energy. And this, of course, always uh, breaks the law of conservation of energy, but let's get to that in a second. Potential energy is defined as mechanical energy, stored energy, or energy caused by its position. <laughs> the energy that a ball has when perched on the top of a steep hill when it is about to roll down is an example of potential energy. They're talking about the actual energy released from uh, falling objects. I mean, hey, Niagara Falls, I don't know if you know about uh, Hoover Dam, you know the actual accelerating water that's falling that actually spins the turbines it generates enormous amounts of electrical power now there's not a single person on this earth or any scientist that has ever said that there is a loss of energy from the water that falls nor is there a loss of energy from say you know an accelerating bowling ball falling off the top of a steep cliff and it impacts and it creates X number of joules of impacted force, for example. There's no transference of energy. So let's uh, give another uh, quotation from a... Uh, at least uh, I appreciate uh, even the quantum quacks when they admit the truth. In general relativity, which of course is BS, in gravitational energy, they're actually talking about uh, potential energy. They said they're just calling it gravitational energy. It is extremely complex. It means they don't know what it is. And there is no single agreed upon definition of the concept. Now, the first thing that someone will do, some, uh, some wackadoodle in uh, the established cult of quantum, so we have established parameters and equations for potential energy of a falling object given its position and mass, you know, barring uh, air resistance. And what. That's true, but descriptions are not explanations, and it is a fact that there is no agreed upon definition of the concept, i.e. an explanation for it. So let's say apply um, analytical, platonic, and retroductive thinking to a mutually, uh, mutual mass acceleration, or just in this case one mass accelerating towards a very large mass. What it actually is is electrostatic torsion. Um, I don't know if I'd actually prefer to call it dielectric torsion, but uh, it's electrostatic torsion. This counterspatial torsion acceleration, or CTA, of a mass towards another, there is no loss of energy of that mass. It is not space-time curvature, as general relativity would have us presume, because there's no such thing as space and time itself. But these are concepts that are reified. Time is only a measure of magnitude. Nah, time does not exist as any sort of principle or modality that transfers one thing to another at all. It is literally only a measure. We measure things via time, the passing of uh, masses and magnitudes. So time doesn't exist, and space has absolutely no properties. As Nikola Tesla famously said, it does have attributes, but space is not a thing that acts upon other things. This is ridiculous. So this notion of curved space-time is absolutely ludicrous. But we've been growing up with this bullshit from general relativity and Star Trek and every stupid side. We've got a curved space-time anomaly, Captain. Yeah. <laughs> So, space, which has no properties, is curved, and time, which is only a measure, is also curved, so we can lump that together. It's like talking about a wave-particle duality. They'll talk about a space-time curvature. There's no such thing as a wave-particle duality. A wave is not a thing. A wave is what something does, and light is not a particle, so there can't be any such thing as a wave-particle duality, and of course, duality implies that Mother Nature is duplicitous, i.e. duality, i.e. inherent contradiction, and there are no dualities or inherent contradictions in nature. None at all. Now, in the case of mutual mass acceleration, or keeping it really simplex, eh, one falling object and the energy therein created at a given interval, 
that could be transferred, t say, to someone's face. Like, say, if someone dropped a, a, a billiard ball from the top of the Hoover Dam and, you know, it hit someone in the head, it would, of course, instantly kill them and probably travel in four or five inches. And that's a lot of energy. But nobody would be stupid enough to think that energy was either created or lost or transferred from the, the mass of the billiard ball itself, right? The mass and all the energy contained in the atomic structure and the molecules and whatnot of the billiard ball is absolutely unchanged. So the energy is not in or of the objects. The objects are not accelerating to each other. This is also the same is true of uh, magnets. People talk about magnetic attraction. Magnetic attraction does not exist. What that is is point source or coherent mass acceleration. In this case, of course, the only thing that actually defines a magnet is a point source emission of the field geometry that extends outside of the physical magnet itself because it is point source. There's absolutely no distinction or differentiation to be made between a 5 watt light bulb and a 5 watt laser. Well, sure there is. You know, one will uh, blow out the back of your eye and burn a hole in your butt, and the other one, a 5 watt light bulb, is useless. I remember the last time I saw a 5 watt light bulb, I think I saw one once. It's like that big and it's meant as a like a book reading light it's useless right but the five watt laser is dangerous what's the distinction five watts is five watts what's the, what's the difference between five watts and five watts there's no difference between what the stupid human beings call gravity and what uh, the same stupid human beings call uh, magnetic attraction the only distinction is an attribution the other one is incoherent non-point source mutual mass acceleration and they're not accelerating towards one another what they're accelerating in is a null torsion point between the two Okay, the same is true of magnets, and this is also palpably visible, and I've got hundreds of videos to prove it, showing that you're actually creating this cavitation torsion, or the lowest possible torsion, uh, in counter space, i.e. the ether, i.e. zero-point energy. I don't care what you call it. Mother Nature doesn't care what you call it either. They're actually accelerating not towards one another, but towards a null point. The same is true of masses. Like I said, the only distinction between so-called magnetic attraction, which does not exist at all, because magnetism is, by definition, denotation and connotation, to smarter individuals anyway. Um, actually, I think about ten things at once. Um, well, this is a problem when you think about ten things at once. You actually will slip off of track, <laughs> because I actually do some of this in my mind, where I'm running like ten trains at once, and sometimes two of the trains will have a train wreck. Um, there's no distinction in uh, mutual mass acceleration when it pertains to magnets because the only talk thing we're talking about is, is the field coherency of that acceleration which is visible underneath the ferro cell. The distinction between the two is merely an attribution of the masses as they accelerate towards one another. The same is true of the magnets. The distinction is merely attributional. Uh, magnetism is by definition, here we go, I'm back on track again. Magnetism is by definition centrifugal force in motion. It cannot be. Um, a, uh, the, the so-called magnetic attraction cannot exist because attraction or acceleration with zero force applied, actually the inverse or the loss or the dissipation of force, kind of like letting air out of a balloon, has nothing to do with magnetism. That uh, centripetal increasing inertia and acceleration, uh, i.e. gravity, i.e. so-called magnetic attraction, they're both one and the same thing. Different attributional natures. Um, that accel mutual acceleration in the case of accelerating magnets or not accelerating towards one another but towards a null torsion pressure point between the two which actually with the supercell or the ferrocell, cell is readily visible. They are not accelerating towards one another. Neither are two masses accelerating towards one another either. Sure they are. No, they're not. Um, they're actually uh, going towards the erasure of space, which is by definition force and motion. Every atom in the universe, as you were correctly taught, thankfully they taught you one thing correct, they'll say, oh, well, and it's partially correct. It's like every atom in the universe is 99.99999% empty space. Like their definition of an atom is the supergiant balloon, like a hot air balloon, and uh, the nucleus is like a tiny a BB on the inside of a super giant hot air balloon. And every atom is like that. Like, you know, what is that 99.99999% empty space? And of course, space is not a thing, it's merely conceptual. That is, uh, every atom, of course, is a dynamo. That's the electrostatic magnetodielectricity that actually holds up the air that actually makes the. Uh, the radius of the atom in picometers, measured in picometers, its actual volume. I mean, there's 
It's not an empty space in that atom that's supposedly 99.999% empty. It's not empty at all. It's a dynamo of magnetodielectricity that exists between the outside parameters or actually the electrostatic shell. They say shells, but there's really only one shell. The electrostatic shell of the atom and the actual nucleus itself. I mean, that is the air inside the, the balloon, if you will. But well, here's another perfect analogy. I don't know if you're this young. Do you remember a rubber band airplane? There are these little balsa wood airplanes and uh, they had a rubber band and you sit there you'd uh, wind up the rubber band and you'd uh, the, the band would quickly unravel you let it go and the rubber band would of course uh, drive the propeller now there's no energy lost or created in the plane or the rubber band so what was it obviously you ate food you had energy you twirled your finger and you add, added a torsion into that rubber band which unwound itself. It wanted to reach a rest null which is itself unwinding, right? The neat thing about rubber is if you twist it a lot it will untwist itself. I mean that's one of the reasons why we have uh, rubber bands and countless other things made out of rubber including condoms right now. <laughs> that will unwind itself but there's no energy lost in the rubber band not either created or destroyed or added to when you wind up that rubber band did you add energy to it no you created a torsion that wanted to unwind itself and that energy released there's there's no energy in a falling object that's as ridiculous as thinking that uh, mutual mass acceleration between two magnets which has nothing to do with magnetism. It's a complete opposite of force in motion and centrifugal divergence. Um, that is not uh, energy of the object at all. I mean, but this is what we uh, talk about when we talk about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the science of gravitational energy, what is specifically called in the equations potential energy. Um, um, and there's no change in the energy of the body both before, during, and after impact. You know, the energy, of course, is not in the object, rather in the dielectric torsion between both as qualified by the term and concept that we use, space, i.e. magnetic divergence of acuity, the torus, the toroid of the release of that energy, which is erased. Space itself is literally the after effect, after effect of the release of energy, of magnetic toroidal divergent centrifugal field. This torsion is always seeking a null erasure. This is why masses accelerate towards not one another but towards a null, null point because space is by definition this uh, divergent force vector which always must be released. And uh, the same is true in the, uh, the, uh, the magnetic loops that we actually see uh, both uh, constructive destructive interference around the, uh, the magnet in the supercell. These are expanding and contracting loops of force divergence which actually paint, if you will, a hypertrochoidal um, divergent. And of course then you actually have to understand polarity and polarity is not merely two-dimensional but three-dimensional and a three-dimensional uh, polarity is of course sets up this geromagnetic precession what we call the Lamour frequency i.e. the torsional toroidal field that is these expanding and contracting loops of force vectors that define magnetism. To say magnetism and to say create space and to say toroidal field, all of these are one and the same thing. Force is magnetism. Magnetism is creating space. But space has no properties itself. It has attributes and space always wants to, I'm not saying it has a consciousness, always wants to self-erase the self erasure of which is either in the mutual mass acceleration of two magnets that we call magnetic attraction which is not magnetism but dielectric acceleration the mutual mass acceleration of bodies or masses not towards one another but towards a null point the null point between the two the lowest pressure that both sink towards masses never accelerate towards one another they're accelerating towards a null point the lowest pressure potential between the two i.e. the erasure of space. Space has no properties so how can you erase it? Space is by definition like I said the after effect of a centrifugal divergent magnetic field i.e. force. The force vector the attributional nature of the entire cosmos itself. The Eoristostias, the, the tolma that the Greeks called it. They also called it ananke. Unfortunately uh, calling it necessity is extremely inappropriate but Eoristostias, ananke, tolma this is the extrinsic principle of, uh, of uh, force release 
as the attributional nature of the agathon, of the absolute. But then, of course, we have to get into discussing monism, but monism, M-O-N-I-S-M. Most people don't know what monism is. Um, anyway, I could talk about this topic basically forever. Sorry I lost track with my brain there for a second. I literally do think about ten things at once, and sometimes two of the trains cross tracks and they, <laughs> they headbutt with each other. Uh, that's the problem with thinking too much. Because you're not just thinking about one thing, I'm thinking about all sorts of things at once. But, uh, thank you so much for watching. If you like these videos, you can always click the link below. You tell me how much you can't stand me. You know, tell me how much you praise the cult of relativity and quantum, which has absolutely no basis in reality and is a laughing stock in the face of Mother Nature or Natura Naturans, as the case might be. Bye.